episode of the Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. As per usual, a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show, liked, commented, all that kind of stuff. Very, very much appreciated. I um, think it went down pretty well. Uh, good eulogy for, for Dan, as they say. Um, shame about the, 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 the demise of uh, the sitting shed, although I think Dan has at least got one more cask uh, remaining, I think it's another cask of, uh, of Glen Shield, which will um, no doubt be bottled at some stage, but uh, um, obviously you won't be purchasing any more casks, and that will, once the stock runs out, that will be it, the end of the sipping shed. Um, big shame, but uh, I'm sure Dan will move on to something, something as rewarding. Anyway, that was last week, and on to this week. Um, Right, okay, so uh, I have noticed that there appears to be a bit of a conspiracy against me, it has to be said. Well, all right, I'm kind of like um, <laughs> over-exaggerating. There's two of you that are conspiring. Um, Richard Hall, uh, to be uh, to, to, to name names, and uh, uh, my good friend Ian Sunderland. Um, uh, basically, the conspiracy is that both of those guys are trying to convince me that Deanston produces lovely whiskey. Whoa, think that's going to be a bit of a bloody tall order, don't you? Um, now, um, for those of you that don't know, and for those of you who do know, uh, I have a category, a system, A to E, uh, for uh, all the Scottish distilleries. And the distilleries that, are cat that uh, come under sort of the category E are affectionately known as the axis of evil. Um, they're either in there because the quality of their spirit is not very good, or the quality of their spirit is, shall we say, somewhat industrial. Um, obviously, Deanston is a fully paid up member of the Axis of Evil, uh, along with uh, such other luminaries as uh, Dufftown, Fettercairn, Glengoyne, Glenrothes, Macduff and sort of Tobermory, although uh, I would classify Tobermory as E+. Maybe one of these days they will do... Um, they will be, uh, you know, promoted from the axis of evil. Uh, who, who knows? Uh, it's called doing a Thule because that's the only distillery that I have actually promoted out of the axis of evil. Um, although I, s I still wouldn't rate them much higher than a sort of D, shall we say. Um, talking of which, you're probably thinking, well, why isn't Jura a, a member of the axis of evil? And that's a very, very good point. Because uh, along with uh, Dal Winnie, I would give them a D minus. So they're <laughs> they're on the cusp, shall we say? Now, um, obviously, uh, there is a sort of a, a jocular element to the, this whole kind of thing. And obviously, I'm not denigrating uh, the the sort of the skills of the people that work at these particular distilleries. And at the end of the day, there are some misguided souls that do enjoy the whiskey from these distilleries. Me, I never have done. It's a style that I'm just not a big fan of. Um, and you're probably saying, well, why am I doing an episode of the show? Well, why not? Distilleries do change. And like I said, you know, the, the, there is this sort of, you know, the, the Tullabardeen uh, story to, you know, uh, and, you know, you, you, you're you always kind of reappraising and you wonder whether, you know, like distilleries like Tobermory may have actually physically made changes to their, their production. But you never know. Anyway, um, although I, it's, I think I did an episode of the show a number of years ago on uh, um, on Deanston. Actually, I think it was 2015. So it's been a long, long time uh, since I've, I've really sort of tasted any Deanston. So it'd be, be kind of interesting. And... Dingston, again, like a number of the Axis of Evil distilleries, kind of is a fully paid up subscriber um, to uh, the inverse of Goodrum's First Law of Whiskey. Now, Goodrum's First Law of Whiskey states that pretty distillery equals pretty malt whiskey. Um, and obviously the inverse is, the, uh, is often true as well. I mean, there are some, you know, um, distilleries that sort of buck the trend to a certain extent. Uh, but generally, as a rule, I <laughs> it's come to, to my kind of like sort of rationale that certainly, you know, the, the look of the distillery does really influence the style of the spirit that's actually made. Now, Deanston is, well, I mean, I suppose if you like sort of, you know, um, 
big old ugly sort of Victorian uh, buildings, then you're going to love it. But it's a big old sort of um, ugly Victorian um, uh, uh, building. It's a behemoth. Uh, apparently, it was actually built, the, the, the building itself, in 1785 by uh, Richard Arkwright as a cotton mill. Um, and uh, I remember studying Arkwright and the Industrial Revolution in history at school because um, I wasn't clever enough to be in the, uh, the top band uh, that uh, got the opportunity to study all the wars. I had to deal with the Industrial Revolution. And interestingly enough, um, the... Uh, the building housed probably one of the most sort of famous of uh, um, things that's attributed to Arkwright, and that's the spinning jenny. Although apparently Arkwright never actually made the spinning jenny. Uh, the spinning jenny apparently was credited some uh, weaver called James Hargreaves, uh, no less, who obviously has been kind of, well, not necessarily erased from history, otherwise we wouldn't know about him, but it's been kind of like forgotten about. Um, apparently Arkwright actually invented the water frame, which was the thing that powered the whole thing. But it seems to me that sort of, uh, you know, he's been accredited with a lot more than he actually did. But anyway, of course, um, that has absolutely nothing at all to do with this week's episode of the show. It's just a sort of like a, an interesting curio. Um, the distillery itself was built in 1965 and is currently owned by uh, Burn Stewart Distillers who are part of the Distel group. Now, like I said, um, yeah, any comments I do make today, uh, they are entirely my own. Uh, you know, certainly if I'm a little bit, shall we say, critical, uh, please do not attribute them to my employer. They have nothing to do with that. This is wholly on me. So if you are a bit annoyed about some things I say in today's episode of the show, you can come and speak to me directly. Um, anyway, I'm probably not going to say much more, am I really? You're probably yet yet itching to know what I'm actually going to taste. So I'm going to put you out of your misery, and I'm just going to introduce today's lineup. Right. Okay. So today's lineup. Um, so as I said, uh, the samples for today's episode, of the show came from my good friends uh, Richard Hall and Ian Sunderland. It's just the way it's kind of worked out. I'm going to look at uh, Richard's two samples first, and we're going to kick off with the uh, Virgin Oak bottling uh, at 46.3 percent, as most of uh, uh, Burn Stewart stuff tends to be bottled at these days. Um, I remember that when this first came out, which was quite a long time ago. I mean, probably. Could have been around about 2015, actually. It might have even been earlier than that. Um, but they did a range of their whiskies, uh, all um, aged in virgin oak or finished in virgin oak. Um, and some were slightly more successful than others. I remember the one that I thought would probably not work um, particularly well was the, the Ockentosh. But that was stunning. I mean, that was a beautiful whisky. That worked so well. Um, whereas on the other hand, uh, the Glengarry, which I thought would have the necessarily cojones to kind of like deal with, um, you know, virgin oak, was a quite a disappointing bottling in actual fact. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, where the Deanston comes in, you know, in, in relationship to those. Second bottling is um, a 12-year-old Calvados cask finish, uh, bottled at 57.4%. Uh, this was distilled in 2007 and bottled in February of 2020. Bottling number three is uh, called uh, the uh, Dragon Milk Stout Cask um, finish. Uh, one imagines the stout was, must have been called the, uh, the Dragon's Milk, one imagines. Um, I probably should have looked that one up, shouldn't I? But yeah, I'm pretty certain that that would have been the reasoning. So bottled at 50.5% and this particular bottling was bottled for and released in 2019. Bottling uh, number four is called the Union Exclusive. This was a 15-year-old Pedro Zimenez cask finish and as you can see, pretty dark so we're hoping that the PX has smothered any distillery character aren't we ooh, ooh, ooh. yeah yeah you're gonna get a lot of that today um so this was distilled in 2014 bottled in 2019 November 2019 at 55.7% and the final bottling of the day will be the Deanston Hanfield at the distillery uh, bottled at 58.9% uh, um, don't know. I'm assuming it was a single uh, Oloroso 
cask uh, and this particular one was bottled in uh, August of uh, 2018 so um, yeah going to be an interesting lineup like I said it's been um, what eight years since I last uh, did an episode of the show on Deanston so I wonder whether things have indeed changed uh, is it sort of still as hard and industrial and um, what have you uh, or has it suddenly blossomed into a beautiful uh, whiskey and I should be sort of recategorizing it um, anyway let's find out then. Okay, so Deanston Virgin Oak let's see what the nose gives us on this thing shall we plenty of oak um, which is not a surprise um, quite grippy gritty uh, tannic um, freshly sawn wood fresh oak barley there is some distillery character noticeable it's underneath I mean it is it just shouts at you um, it's quite industrial green gauge green spice hard barley I, I, I mean I wouldn't say I really really warm to this but there's such a monstrous amount of oak that it, it really is kind of you know um, papering over the distillery character so it's only only really just noticeable um, now some people might say it's fresh and citric and mineral um, and there is you know, I suppose an element of that that's true but oh, it's just that hardness that sort of you know industrial character you know it's as I keep saying you know that's all well and good and I don't mind it per se as long as there's some kind of balancing factor sweetness oak what have you um, so you can argue that this does have some balancing oak maybe a little bit too much oak but you know in this case I'm <laughs> complaining I tell you um, anyway let's see what the power's like The palate kind of follows the nose and it opens up with a big chunk of oak. Gritty, grippy, tannic, very bourbon-y um, feel to it. A lot of vanilla, but lots of tannin. Um, and then in comes that industrial barley, that hard barley. A little bit of um, youthful spirit coming through on the end. It's not fainty, but it's certainly youthful. Um, a little hot. Um, I'm not going to bother putting any water with it because it, mm, um, tart green fruit again um, hard barley it's just a sort of um, it's it, you know it's interesting but it's not soft and fruity and fluffy it's kind of really hard work and, and it's kind of like I said the sort of the oak is kind of really really sort of doing its best to sort of um, blanket that industrial character but you ain't going to put a old dog down as they say right okay so let's move on to bottling number two so this is the 12 year old calvados cask finish let's see what the nose gives us on this oh distillery character ahoy i mean god um it's hard it's i mean really hard i mean almost on the edge of faintiness um cardboard um hard barley green fruit almost kind of green syrup is, is that such a thing i mean it, it oh, it's kind of yeah i'm getting a bit of green i mean it's oh dear it's um it's all a bit all over the place it has to be said this is uh, it doesn't seem to have harmonized which is like you know it's 12 years old i mean i don't know how long it's spent fi in the finishing cask um a couple of years possibly i mean there is some obvious calvadosy kind of notes but it's not sort of again not very soft and sort of um appley and uh, uh that kind of thing it's quite again it's almost kind of emphasizing the hard green in you know sort of um, fruit character um, and it's just making it even worse I mean it really is pretty industrial pretty raw 
Okay, maybe there's a, all right, maybe there's a little sweetness. I've just suddenly sort of got a fleeting note of honey there, possibly. Um, but that really is incredibly hard work. Let's see what turn parts are. Oh, that's a bit of finished mask. Bit of... Mm, yeah, raw, fainty, again, sort of cardboard, um, raw cereal, um, oily barley. I mean, there are some, there's some pleasant Calvados-y notes coming through on the mid palette. There's that sort of Calvados, apple-y kind of character, almost, almost cider brandy. Um, not, but like I said, it's kind of, emphasizing those green fruits, those green cerbic fruits. Um, oh, I mean, that's just so hard and, and raw and sort of, you know, it's just, it wants to sort of like rip your head off and it's 12 years old, for God's sake. Um, oh dear, yeah, it's certainly, um, yeah, I think it's banning its moment, shall we say. Uh, let's see if uh, a little bit of water kind of uh, um, calms it down. Well, yeah, okay. Um, it's a bit flat, um, and um, there's a an element of yeah, there's an element of spirit sulphur as well, uh, which is quite surprising considering it's twelve years old. And I would have thought that the cask would have removed the sulphurous elements. Um, again, more green fruit. It's possibly a little. Not quite so raw, even though I said it's got this kind of sulfury kind of note, um, and it's a bit flat. It's it's not a very appealing nose, shall we say? Um, and then, and you know, I would it, even if I didn't know where this came from. And, and this is the thing: I taste an awful lot of whiskey blind, um, so I have no clue as to sort of uh, where the whiskey actually comes from. And you know, I so I'm. I'm so it's very easy to kind of block out any preconceptions. Um, in actual fact, I'm always hoping that, you know, that my preconceptions will be proved completely and utterly wrong when, um, uh, and, and I always keep an open mind whenever I taste any whiskey, even more so when it's one of the actors of evil, but this is a hard one to love. Anyway, let's see what the power's like. Okay, to give it its dues, it's a bit sweeter on the palate now. The apple notes are a bit sweeter. There's almost a granulated sugar note, but, oh, there's a sourness on the finish now. As the bitterness seems to have gone, and it's been replaced by a sourness. Um, sour, green, underripe fruit. I mean, mm. yeah, that's not particularly pleasant. That was a sort of like a, you know, almost like having a stick shoved up your ass. Um, mm. Yeah, <laughs> not particularly pleasant, shall we say, and a bit of a bit of a surprise. Um, um, yeah, don't quote me on that one. Yeah, so the Dingston sort of Calvados cast finish tastes like having a stick shoved up your ass. Um, mm, yeah, I don't think just are going to enjoy that one somehow. But yeah, not not a fan of that at all. Right, okay, so let's move on to the Deanston Dragon Milk Stout Cask finish. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Okay, so not a huge amount of cask character. Um, there's a little bit of it in the background, a little bit of, of, of sort of malty dark fruit, um, but it's predominantly distillery character. Um, so we are industrial barley, oily barley, edgy sort of or youthfully rose petal, um, touch of bran flakes. Uh, I mean, it's again, it's not as hard work as the Calvados cask, it has to be said. Um, it is hard work, it's certainly not a sort of a pretty whiskey. Um, I'm getting a little bit of, of, of American oak coming through now with time, but it is quite, quite a, a stringent now, and it is quite industrial uh, lots and lots of green green fruit notes again I mean it's 
clean um you know it is what it is at the end of the day like i say i mean this is the distillery's character okay i'm i'm, I'm probably being sort of critical um to my job um but you know this is the style of the distillery if you like it you like it if you don't you're never going to like it um so you know putting one's critical head aside for one moment it's it does what it says you know um on the tin so to speak um I would like to have seen a little bit more um, stout cask on it, but yeah. I actually quite like the start of that because I get lots of stout cask, lots of maltiness, dark, stouty fruit. Um, then comes in the hard barley, the astringent sort of green fruits bittering oak um it really does bitter quite quite hard uh on the mid palate and really doesn't kind of give you anything on the finish at all um it it's more mass than I, I remember tasting it the first time it has to be said i mean it's got pleasant spiciness on the aftertaste the sort of the stouty kind of casky sort of spicy notes are kind of coming back on the aftertaste um I'll go as far as saying this is possibly the most successful of the uh, the three bottlings that I've tasted so far. Um, I'd almost, almost be happy to drink it. Um, I wouldn't want to keep smelling it too much though, but um, I could probably drink it. Actually, it's got quite sweeter with, 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 with water. Again, it's kind of brought out the sort of almost milky sort of stouty kind of sweetness. Um, Distillery character is still noticeable. I mean, you're never going to get rid of that, but yeah, I think that's sort of improved the nose. Uh, ooh, that's a bit of a mmm. Oh, I don't like that aftertaste. I mean, that's weird. That's gone all really kind of sugary and bitter. Um, at the same time and it's kind of like oh no mm, mother god um yeah drink it without water for god's sake um do not put water with it um drink it with without water is actually quite well it wouldn't go as far as saying pleasant but it's it's palatable it's drinkable um do not put water with that at all oh mm. right okay so on to the first of the sherry monsters oh did I say sherry monsters? Um, on to the first sherry uh, finished uh, whiskies of the afternoon. So this is the Union exclusive 15 year old PX cask finish. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Yeah, you knew what I was going to say, didn't you? Um, it's raw as hell. I mean, it's raw, whiny, PX, um, alcohol, balsamic fruit raisin prune distillery character not an earthly not a hope in hell is that good well ooh, yeah if you like raw sherry casks it, it, it's good if not it's kind of replacing one industrial characteristic with another really um a little bit of treacle touch of cardamom green pepper um lots of raisinated fruit like i said it's an, an absolute sherry monster um Nothing is ever going to survive that sort of uh, that sort of kind of cask, and um, I would imagine first first fill PX um, quite quite comfortably. There is a you kind of get an, a, a feeling of industrialness, um, and that's pretty much all of the industrial the the distillery character that's actually going to come through on this is that sort of feeling of industrial character. Um, no fruit, no nothing. It's just a, just a, an, a, an unadulterated sherry monster. So that's fine. Well, it's got a chewy finish, I suppose. Um, the the well, one word that springs to mind. Um, traditional um and that's not necessarily a compliment well you know it, it i 
again, the palette is very much like the nose. It's raw, it's hard, and lots of whiny, treacly, sort of raisinated fruit, bitter tannins, you know, bitter licorice, industrial spirit. It's just kind of, oh my God, this is kind of the sort of stuff that they'll serve you in purgatory, for God's sake. Um, well, I'll probably end up with that, you know. The, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll be chained to a rock and force-fed Deanston for the for the entirety of uh, of my um, purgatory existence. And one imagines, God Almighty, where the hell did that come from? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, oh, let's put a little drop of water with it. Let's see if it kind of removes some of the um, the sherry cast and gives us more lovely distillery character, shall we? Um, Yeah, wow, well, the sherry has completely and utterly disappeared. I mean, it's kind of, it's like I'm, I'm smelling a completely different whiskey. Um, there's a bit of oily marzipan, um, a bit of industrial spirit, well, quite a lot of industrial spirit, actually. Um, a touch of underripe green fruit again. Um, I'm, I'm quite surprised at how much sherry character that's lost, considering it was an absolute monster. Um, that's amazing. Anyway, let's see what the part's like. Actually, that sweetened quite a lot. A lot less bitter, a lot less acerbic, a lot less industrial. Um, maybe you can argue it's become a little bit um, one-dimensional. <laughs> what am I saying? It's become a little bit one-dimensional. It was bloody one-dimensional to start off with. It was a sherry monster, for God's sake. Um, it's softer, a softer one-dimensional <laughs> whiskey. Um, it's actually... Mm, no, I'm not going to say it's quite pleasant. It's actually quite drinkable once you put a little drop of water with it. It's, it, it's kind of, it does take a lot of the rough edges and the rawness away. Um, the shit, like I said, it's become a lot sweeter, a lot softer, um, which is amazing. Um, and there's still some noticeable sherry on the palate, but it's kind of, the balance is actually better. Um, my God, I'm saying the balance is good on the Deanston. Oh, whatever. Um, you know, it's, yeah, the, the balance is better. I could actually, well, you know, I could, I could cope with it with a little drop of water. I was just about to say whether I could drink it or not, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Right, okay, so on to the final bottling of the afternoon. This is the hand-filled at the distillery. Um, like I said, I'm assuming it's, a single Oloroso cask uh, or butt. Um, let's, let's see what to the nose gives on this end, shall we? Raw, green, Oloroso, menthol, green spices, dark chocolate, which is nice, um, balsamic vinegar, raisinated fruits, um, it's another sherry monster. It doesn't have the sweetness to a certain extent that the PX cask has. It's more classically um, uh, green Oloroso, um, green wood. I mean, there is no sweetness really here at all. I'm guessing that the alcohol is probably keeping the, the, the sweetness under control. There's no distillery character again whatsoever. It's, a, it's another sherry monster, um, which, you know, Best thing you can do with Deanston, I suppose. Um, obliterated with sherry. Um, <laughs> neither of which is probably, probably going to appeal to me either way, it has to be said. Um, let's see what the bar's like. Quite a stringent finish. Um, yep, yeah, it's a green herbal Oloroso. That's it. Um, and alcohol, and um, that's it really. Um, there's a bit of dark, dry, dark fruit, dark dried fruit. There's a little bit of dark chocolate, um, a bit of citrus maybe. But it's literally, it is pretty much herbal Oloroso and alcohol, and that's it. That's all you're gonna get. Um, Again, some of you guys are going to absolutely kill for this kind of stuff. Uh, for me, it is just really 
totally and utterly one dimensional. Um, I mean, you know, it's, you just keep sort of asking why. I mean, what's the point? You know, you 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 want your spirit to say something. You know, you you spend. I'm not talking about any distillery here. You spend the time, you know, lavishly sort of, you know. Um, creating the spirit that you want and then what do you do with it you just shove it in a first fill bloody sherry cask and you know nobody can taste your spirit you know it's kind of a kind of it's like i don't know um it's like drawing a lovely mural on a wall and then painting it black you know it's like what's the point you know um anyway sorry about that that's uh let's see what a drop of water does Okay, and, and like with the um, the previous bottling, it's kind of tamed the rawness to a certain extent, a little sweeter. There's even a touch of marmalade coming through now. Um, some burnt edge spices, a little bit more industrial fruit, pepper, um, white pepper, not, not dark pe black pepper. It's less raw there's a slight soapiness as well there just just underneath as well my god i mean this is it's quite complex i suppose um you know if you're kind of looking for all these kind of things um sort of pass one. Yeah, that's bitter, um, bitter dark chocolate, um, dark fruit. Again, still pretty much heavily accented by the Oloroso. There is a little bit of spirit character coming through now. There's a burnt fruit note as well. Um, that is very, very hard to love, it has to be said. Um, I mean, you know, uh, even with a little drop of water, no sweetness has come out, no balancing notes at all. In actual fact, it just seems to have brought out, it's kind of tamed the rawness, but it's brought out the bitterness of the oak. I mean, whoa, you're onto a loser here, really, it has to be said. Um, yeah, not my cup of tea at all. <laughs> So let's sum today's episode of the show. Firstly, a big, big thank you to my torturers um, in Sunderland and Richard Hall for for uh, the, the the flagellation episode of the show. There you go. That's that's there you go. That's that's the title for this week's episode of the show. The the self flagellation episode. Um, anyway, no, um, you know, sort of uh, piss taking aside to a certain extent. Um, Deanston has a character, okay, like a lot of these distilleries do, um, and, you know, I'm not a fan of it, um, and, you know, every now and again they'll produce a bottling um, that, is, okay, like the, the dragon's milk stout once you chuck a load of water at it, um, but they're never going to sort of produce a, a spirit that I particularly enjoy. I like a lovely, fruity, a luscious kind of whiskey. It's a, a whiskey that, you know, I want to come back to. Um, I find traditional sort of industrial styles of whiskey just, just hard work. They just don't appeal to me. I don't really feel like I want to sort of go back to them. But in saying that, that's my personal opinion. There are an awful lot of people that like a lot of different styles of whiskey and everything, it would be boring if everything was exactly the same. You know, if we all liked exactly the same thing, it would be, you know, then you wouldn't be criticising anything. Um, Anyway, um, the virgin oak bottling, um, it's okay. It's very, very heavily oak influenced. Um, so to a certain extent, it, to, it blankets the sort of distillery character, although it is pretty noticeable. Um, the Calvados cask really was not a great whiskey, in my opinion. It, that that Calvados, you know, just, just emphasised that, you know, the, the astringent green fruit. And it was really, really hard going, you know, almost sort of like, you know, fainty at 12 years of old was just amazing. I just never really come across that at all. Um, the Dragon's Milk, I suppose, out of all of these, if I was going to choose one that I would drink, um, that would be the one. I put some water with it. It does sweeten it. It brings out some more of the, the stout cast character. Maybe it's because I like stout and I could just about put up with a bit of industrial notes, you know. Um, who knows? I mean, to me, it was the most successful of the bottlings. I mean, not to say that the other bottlings didn't, well, 
down from here down uh, to the to, uh, exhibited distillery character because they certainly did whereas the last two uh, certainly the um, Union exclusive I mean there was, there was no hope in hell's chance of any distillery character it was, it was a PX Sherry monster it was pointless really at the end of the day um, I mean all right it, 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 you put a little bit of water with it and it kind of the, the sherry just went oh okay we surrender um and you know it was just sort of like leaving the sort of raw spirit kind of sat there going hello um it just really wasn't you know at all uh, my kind of bottling um and the hand fill again pretty much for the same reason it's kind of like you know it just tastes of sherry. I mean, you know, in this instance, maybe that's not such a bad thing because I haven't got to cope with the distillery character. But at the end of the day, it, you know, really didn't tick any boxes whatsoever for me. Um, so, it, like I said, it's it's kind of, it's a personal thing. You know, I'm sure there are people out there, I'm sure some of you guys that, that sort of enjoy this style of whiskey, which is brilliant. I um, mean, if, if you didn't, the distillery wouldn't produce this style of whiskey. Um, for me, like I said, you know, it's, it's never going to be a style that I actually enjoy. Um, but as I always say, you know, you try the whiskies you know make up your own mind don't just take my word or any other reviewer's word for it always make up your own mind at the end of the day possibly be led by you know people that sort of you know review stuff and and and, and are critical of those kind of things but you know always kind of like just just make your own mind up at the end of the day so um anyway um i think this episode has been quite a bit of fun i uh, i'm now going to go find something more more appealing to drink shall we say while i do the editing but until then uh, until next week um good afternoon and a good ramming mm -hmm.